the crossroads of great change, we are faced with a need for great resolve. To challenge the challenging. To build a resilient world for tomorrow. And while we remain rooted to the realities of our communities, today the systems we create, the conversations we hold, actively question these realities and make space for change. Because for a billion Indians to thrive, we must relook at our realities as fluid, our potential for change as flexible and interconnected. So this year, we are coming together to embrace that potential of transforming communities through a convergence of perspectives and continued action that rebuilds the future with resilience. I still see some folks coming on in, but I'd like to take this moment and welcome everyone to the 13th edition of the Dasra Philanthropy Week. And while the last decade has given us great reason to celebrate our economic progress, the devastating pandemic has forced us to confront our current reality. There are two stark realities in how I see it. Becoming one of the world's fastest growing major economies, one can call India, and the other perhaps we call Bharat, where 400 million realities have become the largest number of extreme poor globally. With this backdrop and the fresh wounds of the COVID war, this year's forum focuses on continuity, community, and convergence. Sharing learnings for collaborative action for greater continuity, keeping communities at the center, and forcing convergence towards inclusive, scalable solutions. Accelerating Dasra's vision, a transformed India where a billion thrive with dignity and equity. With you today, Dasra celebrates its 22 years of pioneering an approach to shaping collaborative philanthropy, which we're thrilled to know now has new players, tremendous innovation and a changing landscape. Regardless, Dasra's work is guided by a strong belief in prioritizing the lives of vulnerable communities, trusting and respecting the wisdom of local homegrown nonprofits and leveraging the power of trust-based networks to build social capital with what we're calling a JEDI lens, JEDI equity, diversity, and inclusion. Thus, we now thrives on two core capabilities, becoming the backbone of collaborative platforms and catalyzing proximate philanthropy towards Thusra's mission, collaborative action to accelerate social change. Since 1999, 
Thusra has strengthened the social sector talent pipeline, which many of you have our alumni with you. We've had over 350 Thusra alumni into the sector, fundraised more than $200 million or 2,100 crores to the sector, supported thousands of diverse NGOs across the country and affected the lives we hope of over 90 million Indians. We need a philanthropic revolution and a bold ambition now. And so we're declaring that by 2030, Thusra will aim to raise a billion dollars, 7,500 crores and affect over 500 million lives. Join us in this urgent call to action. Hashtag a billion thriving, the nation needs you, Bharat needs you. And so welcome to this session called Building Philanthropic Infrastructure. It's a clarion call for India to step up. And we have the privilege and partnership over more than a decade with Bain and Company of launching perhaps the few data pieces on philanthropy in India. It's my pleasure to invite Radhika to share the India Philanthropy Report 2022. Thanks a lot, Neera, uh, for the opportunity to partner with uh, Dasra again this year on uh, the India Philanthropy Report. As with previous years, we hope that uh, IPR continues to provide a guide to the overall giving landscape uh, and also act as both uh, to the extent possible a single source of truth, as well as provide insights into key trends. Uh, as Neera mentioned over the last two years, overall giving patterns have also been disrupted by the pandemic. So this year's report focuses on three primary questions. Uh, the first is why does philanthropy and private philanthropy matter uh, and how has its importance grown in recent years? Uh, the second, what are the key long-term as well as recent trends in giving? Uh, this year, we've also taken a stab for the first time at forecasting what might happen over the next five years. Uh, and this is something that we hope to come back to in the subsequent years to, uh, to trace the progress. And finally, what do we need to collectively do as funders, recipients, and broadly the interested ecosystem to unlock giving in line with these projections? So of course, this year's report really comes against the backdrop of a, of a very dramatic year from the perspective of the economy. Uh, we have seen at one end, both a sharp increase in the net worth of UHNI, HNI individuals, but also increasing distress, including metrics like um, an increase in the share of rural poor for the first time in decades. Uh, and therefore, private philanthropy you know, takes on increasing importance in this context. By various common metrics, including the spends of neighboring countries and the Niti Aayog's own estimate of requirements, we're falling short of the spending required uh, against various social sector objectives. Uh, and therefore we'll see a gap in terms of our ability to reach our sustainable development goals. And therefore there is a pressing need for innovation uh, and private solutions to complement public funding towards the social sector. Over the last five years, public spending across sectors has grown at, an, at a fairly healthy pace of about 12% year on year. And paradoxically, it is really private funding whose share of the total contribution towards social sector objectives has declined. While it has grown in absolute terms, the relative share compared to the public giving has declined. Peeling the onion though, each segment within private giving has behaved quite differently. Over the last five years again, uh, we have seen foreign funding towards social causes in India has contracted as a result of various increased restrictions on the deployment of funds and the causes to which it can be given. Uh, domestic private giving, on the other hand, which includes CSR retail funding, as well as donations by UHNI, HNI individuals, has grown at 8 to 10 percent a year, though it has stagnated in the past year through COVID. The, the most recent year's trend uh, of uh, stagnation in overall giving is really confirmed also by the experience of various NGOs on the ground who have seen their available funds become challenged as the existing spend pool has got diverted towards COVID-related causes to some extent. Um, and, and we will look at how this is actually played out across giving segments. Within the private domestic giving overall, which as I had mentioned, had grown at 8 to 10% over the last five years, we are seeing quite divergent trends. CSR 
accounts for more than a quarter of the total giving now, and this is up substantially relative to the last few years. Uh, CSR spending has overall grown at 15% a year, so it's it's outpaced the spending growth uh, for the overall private sector. Most reliable data uh, and is based on bottom-up assessments of giving of the largest companies, government data, as well as trends that have been triangulated on the back of growth in corporate profits uh, of companies in various databases tracking the economy. So this is one consistent increase that we've seen over the last few years. Coming to UHNIs, and, and these we're defining as families with a net worth of more than 1,000 crores. There are some interesting patterns in giving that we've observed in the UHNI segment over the last few years. The first is that while it is a very important spend contributor, it's not as consistent over time. Uh, if you look at this, the, the trend in giving for CSR, for instance, it has been secularly increasing until uh, the COVID year. Uh, but you see uh, that spend from UHNIs is a little bit more lumpy. And this is as a result of some of the, uh, the fact that this spend is being aggregated and given to uh, to uh, causes in um, th that are not consistent year on year. It is currently less than 15% of total private giving, but given past trends, this number may well bounce back up, uh, driven by some large donors entering the space. The h &I segment is the next one, uh, and this is the least clear data set. h &Is are defined as households with a net worth of between seven crores and 1,000 crores, um, but this is the segment which is least consistently tracked. It falls somewhere between retail, which is tracked through a sample survey level, and HNI, UHNI giving, which tends to be reported more clearly. HNI, on the other hand, tends to not be reported that well. And therefore, this is based on both an estimate of the number of households that fall into this segment, the net wealth that they have today, and estimates of giving as a proportion of that net wealth that is extrapolated from the experience of the segments above and below. But we anticipate that there is a significant unlock possible here. And finally, if you look at retail, which is right on top, this today is about one third of total private domestic giving. It has been fairly consistent at this level uh, and is based on, the, the data is actually quite scattered, but this is based on multiple triangulations of both survey data on total giving, uh, for all unorganized giving, as well as income tax filings, um, some information from donor platforms and so on, which track organized giving. At a headline level, like I said, um, eight to 10 percent growth over the last five or six years, but we're starting to see quite different patterns uh, in giving across these different segments. I'll now just quickly delve into each one of these in some detail. CSR is the most broad-based of all sources in terms of sectoral allocation. Uh, as you can see here, in addition to healthcare and education, which tend to be preferred segments across the board, there is also allocation to, to categories like sports, rural development, and others, which aren't so well covered by other donor segments. So CSR has uh, an important role to play in terms of the funding of these segments. The number of companies under the CSR ambit has steadily increased over the last few years. And our benchmark suggests that the 2% profit mandate, which is unique to India, is a key driver of giving in this space. However, giving still tends to be confined geographically to states and cities where companies have their physical footprint. And so broadening of the CSR giving geographically to reach new communities in states that are the most disadvantaged, for instance, in the North and the East, is actually quite a critical imperative here. Over the last year, in line with the, the trends across other donor segments, we've also seen that CSR giving has been more tilted towards healthcare uh, and the Prime Minister's National Relief Fund, which were both uh, directing spends to broadly to address some of the COVID-related uh, exigencies that, that came up over the last year. As a result, we've seen sectors like education, rural development, sports, and some others see a reduction in their allocations. But we expect that, again, as things come back to normal over the, couple, over the coming years, um, we will start to see a reversion to uh, historic trends in terms of giving. UHNI giving is the best tracked in some sense across segments because it can be traced back 
to a few hundred individuals who are uh, major donors. For comparative purposes, the chart that you see here removes outliers across countries. So by outliers, we've defined um, anybody who's donated more than 10% of their net wealth in any year as an outlier. Um, and, and so these have been removed from the analysis for purpose of consistency. And what this then starts to reveal is uh, an interesting pattern of a gap that still exists across UHNI wealth buckets relative to the giving of ultra wealthy individuals in other countries. Uh, this isn't just in developed economies like the US and UK, but also a, a trend that we're starting to see quite consistently and strongly relative to China. We believe this is a segment where there is potential to unlock further giving on the back of changes in the demographic mix of the UHNI segment, equity events, which we expect will start to become more prominent in particular in the startup space. And this is more a supply side driver. Uh, and then on the demand side, greater transparency and institutional capability building, which will be quite critical to uh, encouraging a further unlock in giving. Unlike CSR, which has a wide sectoral base, UHNI giving is quite uh, strongly concentrated on uh, education. So there's a sharp and consistent focus on the sector, uh, which we believe is a result of a focus on uh, improving long-term social parameters. Uh, an interesting emerging trend, which is now held over the last couple of years, is the increasing salience of uh, technology and related sectors amongst the givers who are uh, the, the biggest contributors towards UHNI giving overall. We're also starting to see an emerging population of a younger base of donors uh, who are around 40 years. Uh, these are the people whom we're calling the now gen uh, givers. And we believe that as you, as you look forward over the next five years, this now gen is going to become increasingly important uh, in terms of overall contribution towards UHNI giving. Um, and, and more broadly, um, as we start to see more structured avenues for giving, this uh, now gen should also uh, start to play a more important role. The h &I segment, as I'd mentioned earlier, is in some sense both the least well-tracked uh, across segments, as well as uh, has, has a unique um, challenge in that these givers are often too small to have family offices or foundations of their own, uh, but also at the same time have the potential to make much larger contributions than can be absorbed by uh, the kind of crowdfunding platforms that are focusing on the retail segment. Uh, the chart shows that over the last five years, the number of households which fall into this wealth bracket has consistently increased. And as these uh, as the demand side barriers uh, to giving are addressed, we believe that the h &I segment has the potential to be uh, a major untapped source of giving today and therefore increasingly important in the years to come. And finally, if I um, look at the retail segment, it is still largely unorganized. Um, a, a majority or, or a large part of household giving at the retail level today uh, is towards religious giving, which we have excluded from this analysis. Um, of the remainder, the majority of giving, about 70% or so, still is towards healthcare and is often based on impulse giving uh, without really a structured approach or a plan towards donating. Uh, this is still at an aggregate level largely informal, though uh, over the last few years, we've seen a very slow trend towards formalization, including uh, the emergence of spending that is happening in, in a very small way to, through crowdfunding platforms, which have, which have seen some traction over the last couple of years. As the base of upper middle income households, which are uh, today the biggest source of retail giving increases, we expect that this segment of retail is going to become increasingly relevant uh, to the total giving pie. And therefore, with, with this context, um, we believe that while you know, total domestic private giving has grown at 8 to 10 percent over the last five or six years, there could be 
an acceleration to uh, in that growth number to anywhere between 10 to 15 percent over the next five years if we put in place the right set of interventions as is relevant across segment on the csr front uh, we do anticipate continued growth this is estimated based on the expected rate of growth in corporate profits led by increasing formalization of the economy as well as the consistent 2% mandate that is currently in place, the assumption being that that continues to hold going forward. On the retail side, the biggest driver of the increase in giving is expected to be the continued growth of at about 10% a year in the base of the number of households in that upper middle income segment that are the most important retail donor segment today. Alongside this, as platforms, crowdfunding platforms become more important as sources of aggregation of spend. Uh, we believe this is, uh, 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 this is going to create a new consistent avenue for retail givers. On the h &I front, the most important unlock is going to be the opening of structured giving opportunities. This includes creating access to data on giving opportunities and the channels via which there is a means for this segment to uh, to channel giving to NGOs and other more formal sources relative to the informal giving that is happening today. And then on the UHNI front, we're looking at both uh, an increased relevance of the now gen giving trend that, that we've started to pick up over the, the last couple of years, as well as bridging of some of the gap in giving relative to other economies in the process. So with, with these projections, the, the question then becomes, how can we unlock this potential of private giving? What are some of the key calls to action? As I mentioned, each of these segments has their unique uh, requirements, and, and therefore, the interventions that are required uh, are, are also quite um, specific. In terms of CSR, uh, we've seen a consistent increase in giving it's a, it's a fairly broad base of companies uh, that are contributing but uh, there is an important call to action to geographically diversify away from the location of the company headquarters or company operations as uh, as as is the case today uh, com combined with longer term commitments uh, to ngos to to provide funding for projects which have a duration of 3 to 5 years uh, reflecting what it actually takes on the ground to deliver impact. Uh, and, and then finally, the promotion of uh, the right kind of uh, institutional knowledge in terms of corporate giving best practice, um, as esp especially as more companies come into the CSR uh, ambit over the next few years. On the UHNI and HNI side, which is what we broadly call family philanthropy, the biggest uh, call to action is uh, is around both data as well as mechanisms for the structured deployment of spend. Um, and uh, as as we've seen in the HNI segment in particular, there is um, there needs to be uh, more uh, specific data on where spend is required. Uh, so organized sectoral data on requirements. Uh, what we're also calling shovel red, uh, ready opportunities on causes that can absorb these large amounts of giving. Um, and then finally, uh, the technology platforms and networks to enable large givers to share peer knowledge and best practice on the types of uh, requirements that exist and who's, who's creating most impact in the sector. On the retail side, um, as, as more families start to be uh, to, to reach the stage where they have the disposable income to be able to give back. Um, we believe the imperatives are around um, uh, finding ways to uh, expand giving outside of just healthcare and the impulse giving uh, where spending is concentrated today uh, and creating more innovation around recurring giving models um, that, that create a more structured pathway to spending. Um, and in addition, uh, creating stronger impact feedback loops so that givers have a clear sense of where their money is being deployed, the kind of impact it's creating, which then helps to unlock uh, giving in future. So these are some of the sector specific calls to action. Uh, in addition to which, there is also a clear set of imperatives in terms of ecosystem capabilities 
uh, funded NGO partnerships and, and broader data transparency. So on, on that note, you know, I'd like to also call in Neera to share her perspectives on uh, the broader unlocks that are required on, on the basis of these trends. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Radhika. And it's, it's so helpful, I hope, for others to bring this kind of rigor and data to better understand uh, philanthropy. I'm not going to go into this too much because we have such an esteemed panel here that the faster we can go to hear their perspectives, uh, Radhika, I thought it'll just be uh, good for all of us to, to hear that. Uh, I'm just going to introduce, although none of them need an introduction, so I thought I would share something quirky or a fun fact about each of you, which I hope is, is true, as you come into the spotlight. Uh, so if I can invite uh, Rohini into the spotlight, my I've heard you have a degree in French literature, so maybe you can add some French uh, in your speeches today or help us with uh, a book we should all read. I'd like to bring on Rupa, who I read loves biographies as a genre and personal histories. And your favorite is Catherine Graham, the Washington Post journalist. Hope that's true. Yes, great. Uh, now I'd like to bring on Ashish into the spotlight. Ashish, I read that you were teacher's pet and you got the award from one of the teachers who picked you to actually teach the class when you were in Calcutta. Is that true? Yes, true. And finally, I'd like to invite Atul on this whole theme of being a teacher. His mother is actually a school teacher. True? Yes, true. And I have a fun fact for you, Radhika, as well, that I'm told you're actually quite a nerd and love to learn more and more and sign up for all these Coursera courses, but you don't actually complete them. So maybe you should give your money somewhere else. So welcome, everyone. Uh, let's get back to business. Let's get back to talking about philanthropy. Uh, you would have heard uh, what Radhika shared. Uh, yeah, so why don't we just spend a few minutes on on your reflections, perspective. Uh, Rohini, let's start, please, with you. Um, thank you. Namaste, everyone. Thank you, Dastra. Thank you, Vain, also, for doing this report year on year. It certainly adds great knowledge to the sector and much necessary. Um, hi to the whole panel. Um, so very quickly, um, I'm not surprised about some of the findings. One is that CSR is steadily growing up. Uh, growing because obviously uh, more companies have to meet the norms and we've seen um, some economic growth so that's not surprising if we do want any kind of diversity of giving in csr i'm afraid it will have to be specifically incentivized by law or policy it's not going to happen on its own and maybe a discussion on um now that the culture of CSR has set in quite robustly, uh, how do we do that? And what are the kind of incentives that companies would um, uh, can co-create so that there's much more diversity of giving in areas where the companies do not operate? Um, when it comes to um, retail funding, it's good. Th one third of the sector, it's that's really huge. And you, we saw a huge outpouring of retail giving during these last two years. We do need a lot more scaffolding around, a lot more forms to make it much easier for retail giving. There is some that even uh, we support through our philanthropy. Uh, we possibly need more. But for me, that's the most heartful, uh, heartwarming part of the report, because eventually a lot of people giving a little routinely and structurally every year is the most important philanthropy for a democracy like ours, even more than that of um, uh, UHNIs. Having said that, um, Yes, uh, UHNI's, um, the, the share has come down. Um, this is not great optics, uh, my fellow UHNI's, at a time when we keep reading just exactly how much more wealth UHNI's have made in the pandemic than the rest of the rest of humanity. Uh, but I think rather than look at, say, a percentage of net worth or something, Neera, maybe we need another way to describe UHNI giving. Did they give more? absolute in absolute numbers than last year see because it's a journey it's either you can't keep doubling every year or something because of many reasons and many constraints that we know but even so i think the call to action is right to uhnis figure out the pathways to give much more give much more much more transparently uh you know you know 
share with others what is your passion and your giving. Um, uh, let's create learning sessions um, among UHNIs and between UHNIs and uh, various partners. There's a lot more work to be done there. I think one of the constraints to UHNI giving is definitely a lack of trust uh, between um, say civil society entities who are, may not even be known to UHNIs or lack of communication between UHNIs, their foundations, their staff, and, uh, and uh, the various uh, amazing civil society organizations in India. We have fund like GROW, which we are also a part of, uh, anchored by Idle Give, will help to bring more organizations out there in the front, ready to scale their work so that UHNIs actually have more and more pipes for giving. However, I do think a report like Bain's, I think the attention brought by Dasra, and I think I'm sure me, the media is going to pick this up tomorrow for sure. I think that kind of pressure on UHNIs to, to, to take more and more of the pie of Indian philanthropy is overall a good thing. Um, I think, uh, the world is now talking about trust-based philanthropy. And I think we also need to put the spotlight on that and happy to talk more later in the, in the conversation. How can we learn to lead with trust? How can we learn to start with trust so that we can end up with trust? And I think starting with trust also allows you to unlock much more money. So I think um, that is also an important way to reduce constraints on giving by HNIs and UHNIs. I also think that there is huge scope for UHNIs, HNIs, and their organizations to help organizations to scale. Grow is just one fund, and there are a few other scattered such examples. But today, using technology as a backbone, as a means and not as an end, I think there is huge possibility to invest in the scaling up of the civil society so that no excuse can be made. And in fact, even now it should not be made that there are not enough organizations ready to scale. I think they are, I, there are, I think they need help. Um, and I think uh, some investment of philanthropic capital and making that scale happen is absolutely essential today. So we are in a very critical decade, as we all know for humanity, uh, post pandemic, a lot of recovery to be done, a lot of losses to be caught up on. And this is the year for all people with excess income, with excess resources of all kinds to step forward and really try to make the difference in this one short decade of which only eight years are left. And um, I think we will be held to account. I think wealth will very much be held to account in this decade. And um, it's going to be very exciting and stimulating to collaborate as a community of givers to see what we can do together, which is going to be more than what we are able to do individually. And that then that trend did not come through in the report so much, Radhika, but there is very clearly a new trend of collaboration among philanthropic foundations and individuals. And I think that's going to start to make the difference in the next few years. So I'll end my comments here and hopefully join in later in the um, uh, question and answer round or the chat between us all. Great, yes, thanks Rohini. And we'll, we'll come back to you to peel up a little more and, and hear your comments as you hear your uh, these other fellow panelists. I think we are seeing a lot more collaboration. The, the other side of collaboration, there's been a question mark of a greater concentration of power and therefore is that collaboration actually diffusing that or not? I think the other piece we're seeing that we do need to, you know, continue to fund emerging organizations. So like the Grow Fund, our, you know, $20 million rebuild fund is really going out there to try to find organizations that are emerging and let other organizations actually support these larger ones. So we just need to find a way for both of these engines to, to be on the other side of the giving. And I'd love to hear more of that other side of trust building, Rohini. But I'll come to you now. Uh, Rupa, what was your take just hearing um, the research and some of Rohini's comments as well? So first up, uh, you know, thank you so much, Neera and Radhika. I think you guys do this year after year. And I think the, the first step in developing a deeper understanding is having data and insights on the table, which you guys have done uh, a, so superbly. And so, so kudos to you. Uh, you know, if you were to ask me what was my 
overall reaction on reading your report? And if there's one word to describe it, or actually two words, it is that it's extremely sobering. Uh, I think to be in a situation in India where for the last six years, uh, your overall giving numbers from the private sector have remained flat. At a time, even leaving aside the pandemic, we have seen tremendous economic growth and phenomenal prosperity and wealth increases in a certain segment of the society. Uh, to have no increase, it's, it's a near zero increase in a six year period, I think should give us all room to pause and reflect. Uh, it is very wonderful to see CSR giving going up. And I think CSR has done a lot of good for this country. Uh, and, you know, they have, it has opened up new pathways. But a system of philanthropy, I, I, at least it's my, I humbly believe, cannot be driven beyond the point by corporate giving. I think corporate giving has many strengths, but it also comes with many limitations in driving social change. Uh, and if you look at every other segment of private giving, it has actually declined in absolute numbers. And that is the, what your data is showing us in segment after segment. Uh, so I think, uh, uh, which makes me wonder really, you know, I think our conversations in the sector therefore need to be really strongly focused on the supply side. How do we create a massive movement uh, in giving in this country? How do we significantly multiply the number of givers and the amount they give? And we cannot, uh, you know, I think needs, we need to pay a lot of attention to that, which is why what Ashish is attempting to do uh, in, in one way and what uh, Atul is doing in another way, I think are so going to be so, so crucial uh, in, in, in the coming decade. We, we have to create a movement. We have to create a massive movement towards giving. Secondly, I think uh, we have to make it much easier to give. It is incredibly difficult to give in India. You know, I see the conversations on the WhatsApp group of my college classmates. People don't have a clue uh, on how to even begin the process, right? Uh, so I think uh, people like Rohini, Ashish, et cetera, who, are, who have really set the bar extremely high in terms of setting up and understanding the system and setting up mechanisms for giving, not, not many other people can do that. And so how do we make giving really easy I think it's a function of making the information available. It's about having the right professional cadre of people, whether it is advisors, whether it is auditors, whether it is impact measurement experts. And thirdly, it's about having the standards of reporting and disclosure, you know, whether it is uh, on the impact side and whether it's on finance and governance. And the last point I'll make and step this and stop there is about what are the conversations we are having? Who needs to be in these conversations? And what, what do the nature of those conversations need to be? I think we ourselves as a firm spend a lot of time talking about core grants versus non-core grants and project grants. People uh, need to you know, move. And I think that those are looking at demand side issues. I think the urgent need of the R is supply. I think we just, I think these issues are important, but they are very nuanced issues. And they are, I think, I think, Probably if you had to pick one thing to do at this point, it would be to massively, massively increase the supply of donors and amount of money given outside of corporate CSR. Thanks, Rupa. Uh, that's very helpful. In fact, you know, along with just the ease of giving, I remember we had had a conversation with a group of us and Kishore Mariwala has said, had said, you know what, it, giving is like a muscle. The first time you write your check, it's like a really weak muscle. And as you keep writing checks and as you keep writing checks, it kind of that muscle strengthens and it, it gets easier. And I think that, you know, that applies to all of us. But let's come to you, uh, Ashish, what, what's your take? But both hearing Rohini, Rupa, but also, you know, the, the thoughts from Radhika. Yeah, no, thanks for inviting me, Neera, and uh, hi to my fellow panelists. Um, I think excellent report. I'm so glad that you all put this out on a regular basis. I think as others have said, we all knew that, you know, CSR, I think, has been a great boon for India. It's growing at a steady pace. And I think as corporate profitability grows at 15% a year, as you projected, it's, it's steady, eddy, less volatile. 
Uh, we all knew that foreign funding is declining, and I think the report clearly shows it. And retail, I think, thanks to people like Atul and many others, has really accelerated. Uh, to be honest, I would take the numbers around UHNI and HNI with a pinch of salt. I do think that uh, we do have a data issue. Um, I find it hard to believe that it's flatlined over six years. There has been a, a lot of wealth creation uh, in the equity markets, and, and people are generally feeling wealthier. And the economy hasn't done great, but it's done reasonably well uh, over that period of time. So um, I actually think the giving may be growing at you know, 10, 12%, I, I doubt if it's flatlined, but it, it just shows that there's a greater need for more data uh, for us to be able to uh, particularly get a handle on uh, HNI and UHNI uh, giving. I completely agree with what Rupa said. You know, we're still at the end of the day scratching the surface. You pointed out in the report, I don't even think of it as a percentage of wealth right now because wealth has recently crystallized. But we know that this can increase by an order of magnitude, you know, in the next uh, decade or two. Um, and what we need is a movement around giving. We need philanthropists to connect with this idea of nation building, you know, building a better society, building a better India. Um, I mean, that's one of the big reasons why most people are doing what they're doing. I mean, there's always some elements of legacy and other motivations. But I think a lot of people, because we are a country that has lots of needs, there's so much to be done. Um, I think there is a, most people are in this because they, they want to make India a much better place. Uh, and I don't think we've done enough to sell that idea to a broader group, uh, particularly of HNIs and UHNIs. Um, so I think as uh, Rupa alluded, I think some of us have come together and we're launching a new platform called Accelerate India Philanthropy. And I think the idea is, particularly in the UHNI and HNI segment, there's a need for a few things. One is inspiration. Um, a second is peer networks. I think people need to be connected. They need to learn from each other. Um, and so it's really by philanthropists, for philanthropists. Um, a third is around this perception around you know, trust. There is a trust deficit, like Rohini pointed out. I think we need to educate philanthropists um, that um, it isn't actually as hard to give as you imagine it to be. Uh, and by the way, whilst these people in the civil society space may be different from you, it's not that they're untrustworthy. Um, I think many of them are doing great work. Yes, there's room to professionalize. Yes, there's room for us to help. Uh, but uh, I think most people are doing excellent work and are very trustworthy. So we need to get around these hurdles of trust through information and for changing people's perceptions. I think making it easier to give, like Rupa pointed out, uh, various ways to do so um, could be collaborative initiatives like the initiative you've launched, Neera, you mentioned the 20 million rebuild and many other ways to do it. I think there is not enough attention paid to uh, potential tax incentives. I'm not suggesting that we get a big break but I, I do think that there are some nuances around the tax code that could make it easier. For instance, there is a deduction against income, but there's no deduction against capital gains. Uh, there is, um, it's not easy to donate shares or ESOP. I mean, a lot of uh, folks will have ESOP. Um, how do they, can they just donate um, and crisp, without crystallizing a sort of tax incidence? So I think thinking through, because I think going forward, it's not just gonna be people cutting a check. I think there'll be other forms because the wealth creation really is through equity and that's where it gets crystallized. So finding other ways um, to make it easier, not just tax incentives uh, and, and the laws to be clearer uh, will be important. And finally, I think that, you know, philanthropy needs to be sold, it's not bought. So I think we need to get out there and build this infrastructure, many of us, Neera, what you're doing, um, Nikhil Kamath has launched a new initiative, uh, many other people to build this sort of intermediary infrastructure, people who really create these networks, you know, by philanthropists, for philanthropists, also have the ability to provide some bespoke advice to individuals. I think particularly in the UHNI segment, there's a need for bespoke 
advice. Because I think what we want is initially people may give into a collaborative, but at the end of the day, everybody has their own passion uh, and they need to become more knowledgeable. They need to connect with peers and they need to embark on their own journey. And they essentially need to give more, give sooner and give better. And, and I think that whilst the, your data may not be as heartening over the last six years, although I would take it with a pinch of salt, um, I actually think we'll see a tsunami in the next two decades. I think um, you know, wealth creation in India is going to grow at a fast clip. Uh, and generally, philanthropy comes in a few years after wealth creation. You know, people have to be comfortable that their wealth is more permanent and not um, ephemeral in nature. People also have to sort out in their heads what they're going to give to their kids and how much they want to give to, to philanthropy. People need to build the muscle, as you were saying, Mira. And often for people who are in the throes of you know, their business life, whilst there's a latent desire to do so, it's not front and center. You know, it's, it gets deferred. And so I, I think for that reason, with a lag effect, we're gonna see a tsunami. And if we can build this infrastructure we can only accelerate this tsunami going forward. I mean, I really look at India as being at the moment where the US was like 100 plus years ago, where after the rubber baron era of the 1880s, it's really philanthropy really took off in the early 1900s. You know, the first couple of decades in the 1900s when Carnegie and Rockefeller set up their major foundations. And then there was a big tsunami, it became a, a norm almost. You know, as Carnegie said, he who dies rich dies disgraced. And that became the sort of uh, the, the phrase of the era as it were. And it made people who were industrialists, you know, feel ashamed if they weren't giving. Um, and I, I think we can get to the same place in India. I think thanks to people like Rohini and Nandan and Mr. Premji and many others who've been excellent role models. I think we have all of the right ingredients. It's really a question of building the right infrastructure, the intermediary infrastructure and building this movement like Rupa said, so that we can accelerate this going forward. Great, yeah, thanks Ashish. I mean, we're all often asking ourselves, those of us in this intermediary space, you know, who pays for this infrastructure to, to be built? And you really need some enlightened folks. And, and I can't thank Rohini yourself and Rupa enough for having supported us uh, to, to build really Thasra. We're actually seeing this willingness for bespoke advice, actually people and philanthropists starting to pay for it. Doesn't fully pay for it, but at least in the last few years, a willingness that, you know, okay, I'll, I'll put out a bit to really have my strategy shaped or help me connect. So I think that's promising, therefore, for us to see that that flourish a, a bit more. But Atul, let's come to you and then Rohini, I'm sure you're dying to come back in. So I'll come back to you right after Atul's comments. Thanks, Neera, and uh, thanks, Radhika. Uh, like everyone said, uh, in a very data deprived ecosystem, the fact that you put the effort to uh, gather information from all sources and put this report out, not just this year, but in the years before as well, is very commendable. So thanks for doing this for everyone here. Uh, the fun of coming last is a lot of things you have, uh, uh, have been covered, but I'll try to speak from a practitioner's perspective as we engage with philanthropists, retail donors, and corporates as well. If you look at the CSR ecosystem, uh, you know, historically we have not engaged in that from a given India hat, but over the last couple of years, because of COVID, we got a chance to spend more time in the CSR ecosystem. Like Ashish said, you know, CSR market is going to grow at the pace of uh, profit growth uh, in the India in right? Uh, we are not seeing people come at beyond 2% in CSR, which means that, you know, it's not an opportunity to grow the CSR pie beyond what it will organically do. The real opportunity for everyone to meaningfully sort of uh, deliver better impact or more impact from CSR ecosystem is not in making it bigger, but making it better. And I think the intermediary ecosystem of CSR, I feel was slightly more thriving a few years back than it is now, when people uh, saw the CSR law coming and started creating services, platforms, technology around it. And they realized very quickly that the market will hit a ceiling and after that, where is it going? And the use of some of these things we didn't see as much uh, as we initially thought would happen. But I think that was uh, three, four years back. With COVID, things are changing. Uh, the laws have made it more difficult for corporates to be compliant. 
and the data around what CSR has delivered on impact is starting to come out and it is stabilizing, which means people are rethinking how they want to do corporate giving over a medium term. So longer contracts, uh, thinking beyond their geographic uh, basis to start giving. A lot of these conversations are starting to look very, very meaningful, at least over the last one and a half years for us. So I think there is a lot of opportunity in the CSR ecosystem to focus on even more impactful giving in CSR. And that requires some work on uh, bringing more evidence to the table on medium term CSR programs, not just infrastructure and short term service delivery on the ground in pockets. Uh, so CSR is mostly going to be driven by you know, some, some of this uh, uh, more impactful evidence-based giving. On the HNI, UHNS side, uh, Ashish covered it really well. Uh, it has to be sold. Uh, it is discretionary for all segments uh, minus CSR, even in retail. So unless you have an army of people that are actually engaging with philanthropists to understand their personal preferences, biases, uh, it is very difficult to convert a high empathy UHNI to become, you know, sort of uh, uh, taste giving and then go deeper into it to become a, uh, a sort of a committed giver. And I think that ecosystem hasn't seen as much innovation or investments in the last six, seven, eight years, uh, uh, the window of my observation, but it is starting to change very, very rapidly now. And COVID has brought a lot of people for the first time as givers, which wasn't the case earlier. And this is global, uh, not just in India. A lot of people experienced giving for the first time during COVID. So it just suddenly expanded the top of the funnel in the last two years. And if we don't invest in that now, uh, it is not like a rubber band where it will stay there once the first stretch is done. Right? You have to hold it there for a while for the ecosystem to stay at that expanded philanthropy base uh, to build upon. And I think initiatives like uh, Ashish's effort with ILSS uh, that Anu runs, uh, uh, generally sort of funding unrestricted and overheads for nonprofits to build this infrastructure to ask for money, like the work that uh, you do at Dasra, Anira, on working with philanthropists and doing some consulting around them. I think that needs a, a disproportionate investment in the short term to leverage the opportunity that COVID has provided while we were responding to it. Uh, and I feel uh, like Ashish, uh, I suspect the data from the sense that I would have actually expected that number to be much better than the data is showing, which means that there is more optimism in the practitioner ecosystem than data is suggesting. And I really think there is a lot more there. Uh, because this is a first time givers and very scattered, it's very difficult to gather that data, I suppose. But I definitely think the, uh, the ecosystem has opened up uh, on the HNI and UHNI side. Directionally, I would, uh, uh, if I were to bet on it, I would actually bet on higher than 12 to 14 percent number, Radhika, that's there in the report on HNI, UHNI growth, uh, largely because the wealth creation has been disproportionate and also at a younger age. And people are figuring out what to do with that. And uh, uh, we're starting to see that uh, uh, happen in a very interesting way. YIPP is one initiative, but there is LMP uh, for not at that range of giving, but on a smaller ticket of giving. Uh, collaboratives are something very, very new uh, at the scale and speed at which we are seeing them come about, right? Uh, your own effort, uh, Nira, uh, Edelgro is definitely there. Uh, Samitha launched something as well. Uh, and there is a lot more effort on happening on both uh, creating giving collaboratives, but also collective impact that gives confidence to philanthropists to come together, which is also starting to happen. So that's sort of on the HNI and UHNI side. Retail giving, where I've spent most of my time, uh, I like the data, Radhika, that's there on the report in the sense that it's starting to become more and more formal, which is what we see as well. Uh, it will continue to grow. Uh, uh, I don't know how much of that will be medical versus uh, for other causes. I do think medical has a huge headroom to continue growing in a country like India, where uh, you know insurance systems from government and outside are not covering a very, very large majority of our audience. So there is a huge headroom. I hope that doesn't come at the cost of uh, uh, platforms like ours and others investing in nonprofit fundraising beyond medical, because that's extremely critical 
whether it's on education, whether it's on rural development, whether it's on uh, horizontal causes like gender, climate, stuff like that. And that requires a certain amount of investment from the platforms to grow, not just making giving more formal, but also more balanced as, as the ecosystem evolves. I do think that the formal giving part of it, while the overall category growth, uh, Radhika, the report says, is, is uh, uh, growing very modestly at around 10% or so, the formal giving through platforms and otherwise in retail, uh, I would bet would grow at about 30 to 40%. And that's been the rate in the recent past. It's growing from a small base, but I can continue to grow for many, many years at 30 to 40% uh, uh, overall. Uh, I think there was a comment made on uh, uh, in retail giving in particular, uh, retail givers need a lot of trust to come and give because they are giving on impulse. They look at need and they start giving. And solving for trust is far more important for retail segment than for any other segment. And there you can't solve for trust by having a one-on-one -on -one dialogue with a say a UHNI, where we need a, a platforms, intermediaries, information uh, uh, platforms to come in to be able to solve for that. I know Rupa has been very passionate about uh, the nonprofit sector, transparency, credibility sort of layers to come in. And I really think uh, that's needed in the next couple of years if you were to take it beyond 30, 40% growth on the platform side. Once people come into the giving ecosystem, I think the engagement part of it is totally not cracked right now. There are experiments on recurring giving that the platforms have done. But unless you make intentional giving of a retail donor for the first time to be, make it engaged giving, it won't grow. And there is huge appetite in the middle class of India that's grown well. Uh, to increase their giving once there is engagement and platforms today are not, they are all in the 1.0 version of technology maturity. Uh, and I think in the next avatar of uh, uh, the iteration, you will see a lot more engagement driven giving. Right now it is largely get people through ads, get them into the ecosystem, make it easier for them to give and payments are sorted. And downstream sort of ecosystem is yet to be built to drive engagement. Yeah, these would be sort of components I had. Great, no, th thanks, Atul. I'm gonna come quickly back to you, uh, Rohini, and also add in a few questions that we've heard. If you can talk a bit more about trust and, and what can actually be done there. And so much is asked of, of NGOs. What about the, you know, the other side? But there's also some questions around funding being quite siloed, as in uh, UH&Is like to give more to education, you know, the retail gives a little bit, gives more to healthcare. Do we have to stay in these structures and what can we do actually to unlock overall kind of domestic giving if you want to just pile that all in? And then I'll come to you, Rupa, with a question and Ashish as well. Yeah, uh, thank you, Neera. Um, I'm glad there are a lot of questions showing up in the chat. Um, I think in terms of trust, yeah, well, um, I've talked about this a lot, but um, definitely, uh, a lot more people need to just, you know, begin to more generously give to organizations with great flexibility of funding. And also, sometimes we forget uh, we need to be as donors trustworthy too. In the sense, do civil society organizations trust us? Is a question we should be asking ourselves in the mirror in front of us. And why should they trust us? They might trust us if one is we, we start with trust on them and are not, are not suspicious. Secondly, they might trust us more if we commit multi-year funding, right? Unless something really bombs, there should be a clause in the contract saying, okay, if something really goes wrong, we can pull out. Um, but otherwise that if I like the work that your organization is doing, you can trust me to support you over time because I know if I don't do that, you will not succeed and I will not succeed either then as a donor. So uh, opening up several avenues like that to build trust is bound to lead to more innovation, more collaboration, and eventually more impact at more scale. So um, that's what we do in terms of trust. A lot of people learned that they had to trust in the pandemic, right? So they had to give, um, uh, they had to change the uh, allocation of capital. They had to find new partners very fast who were untested because work needed to be done with urgency. Building on that and making trust-based philanthropy a, a cornerstone of your giving is something I think that's very important and will reduce the trust deficit between givers and 
receivers, though I don't like those terms, but anyway, uh, in this country. So that's on trust, unless you have something specific more to ask. But um, there's one more thing about diversity and going beyond education. And of course, education is very important. We spend, uh, Nandan actually more than me, spends a tremendous amount of our uh, giving on um, the technology enabled platforms uh, that we have been working so closely with government on. And it's important to continue to do that because the nature of learning is changing and we need investments, risk capital in new forms of learning anywhere, learning on the go, different people learning, different life skills. So while education remains a key sector, um, you know, some uh, businessmen tell me that their business is their philanthropy because of the fantastic impact it has on society and livelihoods. And I would say to them, yes, thank you. It does create overall uh, benefit for society. But sometimes successful businesses also create negative externalities in terms of, say, pollution, in terms of, say, unwanted migration and several other things. So there are those gaps to fill outside your fence as well. And then what about building the entire intellectual infrastructure of India that is still waiting to be built? We need so many more research organizations, science organizations. We need so many more cultural institutions to come up. So, uh, you know, starting to imagine new ways of giving beyond the normal is, is really, maybe we just need more brainstorming sessions, you know, without somebody having to pull out a check at the end of the evening to say, okay, if you just had to just think of wonderful, joyful ways of giving to something that you're, you could tell your children proudly what you started in this country. Look at all the monuments lying around this country, which are totally unprotected. Pick up something of your passion and do it. And I think that 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 what Atul was talking about, as you give more, the, of course, the muscle grows, but you also connect more deeply and joyfully uh, with the work that you're doing. And I think that joyfulness matters a lot. So... I think we are going to see, Ashish, I hope you are right, that we are going to see much more giving and we are going to see much more structured giving. Um, and uh, certainly we are here uh, for the long run, along with all of you uh, in, this, in this venture. So th thanks, Roni. Since you in some ways tagged Ashish, Ashish, there is a question that I'm going to direct towards you, which is, you know, why do, do we need to be following the Western way of philanthropy? And is there something that might be different to India in our, in our trajectory? Yeah, I think there are a few. I only use the Western example more to say that um, philanthropy really takes off with a lag effect after wealth gets crystallized, you know to typically a decade or two later. Um, I, I do think it, our model can be a, a different model in several ways. Um, I think one is that convincing more philanthropists to give while living. I mean, I think Western philanthropists tended to set up these foundations with endowments. I, I think in India, our pressing problems are in the next 10, 20, 30 years, hopefully, we would have crossed the hump and become a more developed country in 30 years from now. So I think convincing people that they need to do it much sooner and while they're alive, so that's one. Two is, I think in the Western model, there isn't the opportunity to work as closely with government. Um, I think India is different in that you can really partner with government and particularly as local philanthropists, I think there's that real opportunity. Uh, to do so. Um, and, and thirdly, I think, um, you know, we have so much to learn from other, not necessarily Western nations, but I think from the rest of the global South, you know, there's lots of examples when I think philanthropy was taking place, uh, we have philanthropic models from the West, but we have lots of development models from ASEAN, from certain parts of um, even Africa or Latin America that have done things well. And so you don't have to reinvent the wheel, or even within India. Uh, knowledge is, you know, is just so much more readily available uh, than it was 100 years ago or 50 years ago. I, I think we know what works. It's a question of getting things going. And so I think at least with the UHNIs, I think the collaboratives and all is great to get people started. But I think a lot of it is talking to, is developing people's own agency. People have a passion. There's generally fairly hardworking people. 
they have some competitive edge if they've made money, um, you know, and if they can really get invested in the area that they're working in, they can do tremendous work over 10, 20 years. And I'll give you two, three examples. Just in the last week, I met with Sunil Wadwani, who had set up Wish Foundation and the AI Foundation, with and he wants to do two more things. He's ambitious. He's not just stopping with the AI thing in Wish. He wants to do two more. Or Rizwan Koita, who just set up this new Digital Health Foundation, who's young and brilliant ideas and doing stuff that's, you know, really yeah, innovative. So I, I think as opposed to Rizwan just participating in, you know, the usual nonprofits, I think he's finding his own path and he'll end up doing very interesting things that we may not think of. And this is true also of the number of the young unicorn founders, etc. I think they'll bring new energy, new ways of doing things. So I don't think we have to worry about the supply side or, you know, NGO readiness. I think people will, if you can create agency and if people really want to put in some time alongside their money and they're really passionate about it, there's no dearth of ways to spend money uh, effectively in India. Uh, and we need to do it now or in the next 10, 20 years as opposed to waiting for much longer. Yeah, no, th thanks, Ashish. Rup, I'm going to come to you just to build a bit on what Ashish was saying, which is, you know, both a positive and a challenge with this innovation as philanthropists innovate themselves. And I know that, you know, you represent uh, Pierre Omidyar's uh, funding and you support other organizations. And I think there is a question for the existing organizations asking themselves, how do we stay relevant with all this new stuff coming in? Atul, I know you have an incubator also with, with these with these new ideas. But Rupa, there was a question specifically on the social stock exchange, if you just want to speak a bit to that, but also the approach that, you know, Owen has taken. Yeah. You know, on, on the issue of, uh, I, I, I'll come to the social stock exchange, but just a quick comment on the issue of diversity that Rohini spoke about and the fabulous example uh, of Rizwan that uh, Ashish just gave. You know, I think, Philanthropy is the ultimate risk capital, right? I think it has it has appetite for infinite risk taking, you know. And I think the question, therefore, is how does uh, how do different categories of uh, philanthropists deploy that uh, risk capital? Because you there are no returns promised to any LPs or any shareholders. Uh, they you're not a government funder, so so. So really, I think the question is, and, and taken in the context of Rohini's comment on diversity, you know, there are, the bulk of the money goes into certain areas, you know, over 90% plus. And the question is, you know, I think philanthropy has the capability to push the envelope in new directions and push the thinking and that money, no one else is going to deploy. Governments are not going to deploy, private uh, people, are, uh, private sector is not going to deploy. Neither is the, the mass philanthropists, you know, the, 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 the folks who work with uh, say Atul and Give India. And, you know, so causes like, whether it be very important causes like online safety of women, for example, in an increasingly digital world, or online dispute resolution mechanisms, uh, you know, because, you know, the, are so important or, or even things like we are working with Atul on, on land and property inclusivity, property titles, for example. Now, of course, the government has taken it up on a war footing, but it took a while for that sector to reach tipping point uh, for governments to really see uh, the, the, the importance of doing that, right? So I think philanthropy has the way to chart out the next frontiers for society. And, and I think the, 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 the sliver of people that Ashish is going looking at working with are probably the best suited for that. So I think also, I think there is a role and responsibility of different kinds of philanthropic capital. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I just wanted to call that out. I think the social stock exchange recommendations, there were two committees set up by SEBI back to back. And, 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 and uh, you know, now, of course, the regulations have to come out and we'll see what finally reflects in the regulations. But the philosophy that, that we had in the various committees was as follows. One is, can you come up with mechanisms which are uniquely tailored to the Indian context? 
that make it possible even for smaller NGOs to participate on the social stock exchange, which by the way is not a new institution, but a new platform proposed to be created on the BSE and the NSC, right? So that was the idea. And there are three broad buckets of recommendations. So the first is a slew of new instruments you know, whether it be donation certificates, which they, which have been called zero coupon, zero principal bonds, or, uh, you know, social uh, impact funds, which are modifications to the SVF guidelines, uh, and, and things like that. So there are a new range of instruments that have been proposed. Very importantly, a lot of emphasis on ecosystem and infrastructure building for the non-profit sector. So, you know, how do you have an accreditation process for people who do social impact measurement? How do you really bring in auditors into the space to really have standards which are realistic given the size of the NGOs, et cetera? Uh, but how do you bring, allow, bring about some element of standardization? Because, you know, a large part of building trust, if, you, if we really have to make this a movement, it has to be made very easy. You know, so the, 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 the reporting standards, et cetera, very simple, very standardized, makes it very easy and also contributes to building trust. Uh, and, and finally, I think there's uh, the, the recommendations also include a whole new set of uh, institutions, therefore, information repositories, social impact auditors, certification programs, which the NISM is going to come up with, uh, and, and finally, standards. So I think there's been a set of prescribed uh, recommended standards for, for reporting, which are, which are tailored to the size and stage of the NGO. You don't want to overburden a small NGO, but stage appropriate reporting and disclosure standards have been recommended, as have uh, simple ways to report on social impact in, in a way that, that is relatable, standardized, where you don't have to really, uh, you know, tear out your hair to figure out what's really going on here. Um, you know, so there is uh, the uh, underlying yeah. assumption here is that there's going to be a, how do we activate a system where many, many people come in, just like you would invest in a mutual fund, for example, standardize a lot of things. Uh, so there is an entire layer, untapped layer there, which you can call HNI, or you can call even below that if you build a really strong movement on why giving is good. Uh, you know, and the social stock exchange recommendations were designed to cater to that segment. Uh, but the the really the risk, the ultimate risk taking pushing the envelope on the next frontiers in philanthropy into causes which are uh, uh, or going the road less traveled, I think, will come from the UHNI sector. Rohini, you want the last comment and then I need to wrap up. I see oh, your hand. Oh, no. yeah. oh, I'm sorry. I, we have run out of time. No, I was just thinking, Rupa, to your point about the social stock exchange. Um, I mean, I, I hope it goes well, but it is in some sense antithetical to risk taking. So I'm, I'm not sure so much of the risk taking that is needed to help grassroots organizations and leadership and ethical leadership on the ground just innovate and try out all kinds of things. And that and what you just described on the social stock exchange, do you think they are, um, you know, opposite to each other? That's a wonderful and a spot. Very, very, very good observation, Rohini. So I think it is different strokes for different folks, right? So if you have a standardized approach, let's assume for a moment that it will be in the more traditional sectors of giving, right? And so therefore the attempt is, and these are people who are making their first entry into philanthropy and all of that. So the more you can standardize, the more you can build trust, the more it is easy, easy mechanisms for giving, whether it is social venture funds, whether it is donation certificates and all of that. Yeah. I think the real innovations in philanthropy will not come from this segment. Uh, it will come from the ultra high net worth segment uh, who I think have, will give it, pay the time and attention that, that, that Ashish talked about, Rizwan, the kind of time and attention you pay to thinking about issues. I think pushing the frontiers. So I think we also have to be realistic uh, Rohini, about our expectations from different segments of givers. And with that, Rupa, I, I do want to save a couple of seconds, Atul, for you just to come in, because I know a big, you know, strategy and thrust for Najee is looking at innovation. Do you agree with this tension between standardization and innovation a bit, if you want to give your thoughts? And then I do need to wrap up. <laughs> yeah. So Neera, I think uh, uh, you need sort of just common uh, minimum infrastructure required so people don't have to worry about information, data, transparency, credibility. 
at that level standardization is absolutely essential but i think innovation will come then on top of that once the basic infrastructure to enable giving is there and we see a lot of that will link to talent technology uh, risk taking capital those enabling conditions coming on top of uh, whether it's social stock exchange or uh, non profit platforms of similar kind coming and enabling uh, some uh, digital common platforms to build on it super thank you so so i do want to promise our audience and listeners that we will come back together and talk about jedi gender equity diversity and inclusion and and how can philanthropy really start to lean in more uh there i also wanted to congratulate rohini on being selected the best grassroots philanthropist in forbes this year congratulations rohini but i think with that supporting of grassroots must come something that i read about in isabel wilkerson's cast book on cast and i do hope our philanthropy conversations begin to address issues of cast which are issues of deep inequity in our country and her book talks about radical empathy so i just want to leave you with those this quote uh, as we end radical empathy on the other hand means putting in the work to educate oneself and to listen with a humble heart to understand another's experience from their perspective not as we imagine we would feel which sometimes philanthropists do radical empathy is not about you and what you think you would do in a situation you've never been in and perhaps never will it is the kindred connection from a place of deep knowing that opens your spirit to the pain of another as they perceive it empathy is no substitute for the experience itself we don't get to tell a person with a broken leg or a bullet wound that they were not in pain and people who have hit the cast lottery are not in a position to tell a person who has suffered under the tyranny of caste what is offensive or hurtful or demeaning to those at the bottom the price of privilege is the moral duty to act and one sees another person treated unfairly and the least that a person in the dominant caste can do is to not make that pain any worse and with that, thank you all for joining this session. We're going to have a quick poll for you to answer. Please come to our other Thusra Philanthropy sessions during this week. Thank you, Rohini, Radhika, Rupa, Ashish, and Atul. You don't get to fill out this poll. 